Um, actually, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to start off by thanking uh, Professor Nielsen and uh, Professor Milan Ole Milander for inviting me here. Uh, it is um, quite an honor to be present today, and I'm hoping that uh, I can bring something uh, to, for us to discuss. I'm actually bringing um, some of our opinions of the work we've been developing um, back in Portugal concerning early detection of patients that uh, might have added um, cardiovascular risk. So um, the overview of what uh, I was um, trying to do here today is uh, actually touching uh, five points, not only the definition of abnormal vascular aging, but also how can we screen it and who should we screen uh, if uh, there are any differences in the screening strategies between the population and the individual level, uh, and what could be possible interventions. And then for a short uh, review, what have we have been working on in, in Guimarães in, in Portugal. So the, the fact is that um, it is obvious from several of the evidences that had been presented here during this symposium that um, vascular aging and aging itself begins in the womb and proceeds uh, onwards uh, after, um, after birth. It is also um, intuitive to think that if you don't uh, look only at the chronological age of a person, the success of its aging is particularly uh, intuitive if you think of the match between their chronological and their biological aging and how can they achieve, uh, in, in which health state they achieve a uh, uh, higher uh, chronological age. So normal vascular aging uh, is, is actually occurring each day um, uh, that it passes, obviously, uh, and it is um, something that uh, comes, derives from a, an equilibrium between the uh, insults, the mechanical insults, endocrinological insults, the metabolical insults, the chemical and the oxidative stress insults that the, the vessel wall suffers, and its ability to repair and to react to those insults and keep their structure and function as um, preserved as possible. When this capability of repair uh, is overwhelmed, or when um, these insults become cumulative, then uh, vessels become become stiffer, and the, 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 the arterial uh, aging continuum meets at some time the atherosclerosis continuum and, and cardiovascular disease occurs. So through um, arterial stiffness as a, a measurement of subclinical organ damage, uh, we can identify patients um, and, and we can identify in subjects how uh, they are, have been um, uh, uh, being able to cope with their aging process uh, using pulse wave velocity as a gold standard to measure arterial stiffness. It is clear for everybody that uh, arterial stiffness and pulse wave velocity gives us uh, not a snapshot of um, how the, the, the different subjects have been exposed to different cardiovascular risk factor levels, but instead how in time they have been reacting to this exposure, not only of known uh, cardiovascular traditional risk factors, but also of unknown um, insults, uh, whether they are metabolical or mechanical, or uh, of oxidative stress nature. It has been obviously documented and discussed this, during this symposium the independent predictive value of pulse wave velocity to um, uh, define people at risk for cardiovascular mortality and uh, cardiovascular events. And with the reference values collaboration, defining uh, the, the, the cutoff values for normality and for reference subjects within the population at different age levels adjusted for uh, blood pressure levels, it is easy nowadays, uh, or easier nowadays, to uh, try and um, classify subjects within this normality range or place them at a different risk um, uh, using the distance from this uh, normality or reference range values for his age and his blood pressure status. So this uh, will probably allow us to identify people that at their uh, different age are trying, are following the path of what would be their normal vascular aging within this equilibrium of insults and repair. And those who, uh, due to the interaction of the different cardiovascular risk, risk factors and insults, are actually having their normal vascular aging process accelerated and uh, thus enter in an earlier vascular uh, aging uh, process with pathological consequences. 
So um, if we had to define early vascular aging, uh, we're using it as a concept to try and um, pick out of the, the, the population, out of the people we follow, out, out of our subjects, the ones that really um, are in the wrong path and are um, uh, following um, and are being unable to cope with the aggressions that they suffer and actually uh, going faster in the, uh, in, the, in the aging process, we could probably use it as a concept of unsuccessful aging, uh, where obviously the, the aging process is accelerated not only through the normal um, uh, interaction of the age-specific insults, but also of the different cardiovascular risk factors. How can we measure it in practice? We've all, all also already um, talked about the value of pulse wave velocity. Is it feasible to consider pe people in uh, early va earlier vascular aging if they are um, above the 95th percentile for age and sex or above the 95th percentile of the z score of their pulse wave velocity as proposed by uh, Kotsis and Professor Nielsen in, 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 in different articles? Should we do the two d different standard, two standard deviation from the normal value for age, sex, and blood pressure category? This is something that we are debating and uh, that we are still discussing. It is, of course, clear that pulse wave velocity increase is associated with increase in risk for total cardiovascular events and mortality and even all-cause mortality. And if instead of one meter per second adjusted for age, sex, and uh, different cardiovascular risk factors, we use the, the, the standard deviation um, increase, this uh, increase in risk is even more substantial. But other uh, central hemodynamic variables have also proven to have uh, a, a strict relation uh, with um, cardiovascular events and cardiovascular uh, mortality. Uh, should they be included in our um, screening process for early vascular aging? Is there an independent value of adding these very central hemodynamic values to the pulse wave velocity values that we are already uh, nowadays using? Um, this is something that uh, needs to be addressed and that will become easier once reference values for these variables will be published. So I could not resist but to um, use Professor Vlasopoulos' uh, idea of quoting uh, Niccolo Machiavelli because, in fact, it is uh, really in, uh, rather uh, easier to uh, cure and detect a, uh, cure a disease when, when it's in, in the beginning, but earlier... Uh, it is probably more difficult to detect. So, so should we really use this um, concept of early vascular aging to detect earlier people that will later on have a disease that is not reversible? This is our question. Um, and in fact, for most of us uh, that, that do the, 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 the clinical practice job uh, and that, that are used to look at cardiovascular risk factors, uh, particularly at the, cut, the pathological cutoffs and the treatment cutoffs, uh, we should probably have the notion that um, the insults at the vessel wall and the correlation of the different levels of a, a, a specific cardiovascular risk factor uh, is not uh, determined by its cutoff treatment value. So it starts rather early. Uh, and this is uh, probably something that sometimes we uh, neglect uh, in the uh, therapeutic frenzy of starting treatment only if it goes above a uh, different cutoff. So the fact is that the, the, the relation of increasing lycemia uh, with, cardiovascular risk fact, with cardiovascular disease is established, and that if you look at different countries and look at their mean blood, blood, blood uh, um, fasting glucose levels, it's for the majority of men quite above the value that is determined as the minimum exposure, fact, uh, minimum exposure uh, levels for development of cardiovascular disease. And you see the same uh, thing for uh, body mass index in different countries uh, and for uh, mean blood cholesterol. And if uh, one could think that uh, probably these mean values uh, overshadow differences uh, related to um, specific age classes, and if we have doubts that people in younger age classes are starting to be exposed to um, uh, levels of cardiovascular risk factors that could interfere with the normal aging process, 
it is a fact that if you look at populations younger and at younger levels, at younger class, age classes of the populations, you already see that they, that for the majority of them, they have uh, blood uh, and uh, blood uh, cholesterol and blood pressure levels that are quite above those that are considered uh, the minimum exposure for development of cardiovascular risk. Um, this is a known slide of the correlation between systolic blood pressure and the development of um, uh, both uh, stroke and uh, coronary heart disease. These are the mean values documented uh, throughout different European populations and the minimum exposure risk uh, um, values uh, in red. But our concern was to look into what happens at younger age groups. Are they also uh, exposing uh, people uh, are there, are there uh, also, in what concerns blood pressure, exposed to higher uh, blood pressure levels? And in fact, in the Morgan project that w um, congregated 34 European cohorts, uh, um, you could see that in the age strata of 19 to 39, people had a mean blood pressure of 124, uh, way above uh, the, the, the minimum exposure factor. At the same time, sorry, uh, if you look at different uh, populations that uh, have um, exhibited recently data concerning uh, mean uh, uh, systolic blood pressure levels, you can see that both in our cohort, but also Professor Scuteri's, uh, uh, the, the Previmed um, study in Spain, and, and, the, and Professor Neil Poulter's group in England, you can see uh, quite uh, strikingly, that especially in men, these blood pressure levels in younger ages have uh, been surpassed as uh, exposure to uh, arterial disease. Is it so in other parts of the world? Uh, not in the United States, where uh, trends over the last 10 years show that uh, younger subjects have uh, lower uh, blood pressure levels. And especially when you compare uh, North American countries with European countries, with six European countries, uh, y you can see that uh, actually in younger uh, age classes, uh, the North Americans fare uh, quite lower than the Europeans, and so do different uh, um, people in um, South America in a seven-city study where uh, obviously only in a few of them you can see uh, uh, exposure to higher levels of blood pressure from an early age. So is this important, this, this exposure to, to levels of, um, of cardiovascular risk factors that are not uh, considered by us as pathological, uh, pathological levels. Uh, and one of the answers that I could uh, uh, find out was uh, when the, the um, Mr. Fit and the Chicago Heart Association studied the evolution uh, for, of their uh, subjects for 16 to 22 patients, dividing them in, in low and high risk cohorts uh, at very early ages. And you could see that the blood pressure there were uh, very, uh, very, were quite low. And that, in fact, by being able to keep their, their uh, be, being able to be stratified as low risk would add them uh, up until nine and a half years of, uh, of um, esteemed, uh, estimated uh, life expectancy down the line. So working a little bit on this idea, we went to see how many people could we say that actually nowadays um, have uh, healthy uh, arterial behaviors or healthier healthy uh, cardiovascular uh, behaviors. And in fact, in this study done in the States, you can see that out of seven um, uh, health behaviors or uh, seven uh, um, health behaviors being uh, to eat uh, at least uh, three servings of vegetables, uh, doing exercise, uh, have not smoking, and having a, a BMI below 25, and cardiovascular risk factors controlled to levels below the ones that we have considered as exposure only uh, about 80% of the population only had uh, two to three uh, um, uh, ideal cardiovascular health behavior. And if you, if you divide them for the behaviors, you see the same thing, and for the health factors, controlling of blood pressure, controlling of uh, fasting plasma glucose, controlling of lipid levels, you can see that uh, less than 90% of them, or, or uh, approximately 90% of them, do not have uh, uh, two of them controlled. So the minimum risk exposure uh, and, and the population at risk are really considerations that uh, uh, one should have uh, when trying to understand 
uh, how to pick up uh, patients in the, in the population that are accelerating their uh, vascular age and uh, going through a pass that will expose them to uh, later on cardiovascular uh, disease. These are higher numbers and they could spring, sprout uh, um, uh, public health interventions that would be important to us. So at the individual level, we nowadays have some pointers as to when a subject comes to us in the clinic, how, if we should refer him to, to screening for early vascular aging, the, the positive cardiovascular uh, family history, the different existence of different cardiovascular risk factors, uh, the, the preconditions, the prehypertensives, the, the, the ones with uh, dysglycemia, people who, from whom we know that the, their early life data and the, the, the early birth weight, the, um, the, 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 the mismatch, uh, uh, mismatch um, on, on weight uh, gain, people with um, obstructive sleep apnea and chronic inflammatory diseases. We have already touched these points during the, the seminar, so uh, I will not be speaking of them, but these are the examples of people that uh, we should screen for uh, earlier and accelerated uh, vascular aging, and in fact, where we could find people that are already at risk and that already have subclinical manifestations of cardiovascular disease, as is the case sometimes, and I'm only going to mention the inflammatory disease because they have not been sp uh, addressed uh, here, as is the case for people with arth rheumatoid arthritis that have been followed for many years and to whom uh, not only having, in, having a different cardiovascular risk factors would increase their risk of cardiovascular disease, but uh, if you, they have none cardiova no cardiovascular risk factors, and if they have high activity of, of the disease, they would obviously be at higher uh, increased risk for cardiovascular manifestations. So the interventions uh, bring us back to um, old uh, recipes for uh, new and, and greater problems. Uh, it's, clearly that you, it's clear that you should eliminate tobacco, do more exercise, have a low salt diet and moderate alcohol intake and a sp specifically uh, richer diet in, in, in as we do in the Mediterranean diet. And uh, if it is uh, obvious why we should eliminate tobacco and to uh, moderate alcohol, alcohol uh, in, uh, recently some new publications have um, shed some light on how we should do and why we should uh, propose uh, to people at uh, higher risk to perform more exercise. If we see these hypertensive men followed for four years according to their uh, exercise capacity tests and their uh, uh, cumulative cardiovascular risk factors, those that could perform better uh, as, uh, uh, as um, in the exercise test were almost could almost um, annul the presence of dis different risk factors when they were compared to uh, people that could perform uh, worse uh, in, in their exercise uh, test. And uh, a couple of, two months ago, um, a new Cochrane review has been published uh, advocating for the reduction of salt uh, in the diet. And this could be important for both hypertensive and non-tensive subjects being that if we could achieve a reduction of 100 millimoles of salt uh, in, uh, in four weeks could uh, change blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury in hypertensives and by four millimeters of mercury in the normotensive group. The only difficulty is that uh, to lower about 6.6 .6 grams of salt per day uh, whether it's, it's on, on normal tensive or hypertensive seems to be a very challenging task. Uh, uh, you should remember that only by eating unprocessed food and if you add no salt to the food, we do already have uh, approximately two to three grams of salt uh, uh, included. So it seems quite difficult to, to bring them back. And um, for the diet, in a recent study developed in Spain, people ha that were um, uh, during four years followed after having um, uh, prepared and uh, furnished a diet that would uh, have increased in olive oil consumption or uh, nuts consumption, they had uh, to stop the study earlier because people that were following the, this Mediterranean diet, uh, either with olive oils or nuts, could have had a, a significant reduction in cardiovascular events when compared to people that were doing their ordinary, uh, ordinary diet, even if they also had uh, a nutritional, uh, nutritional advice. So 
for the other uh, interventions, it, they have been discussed here, uh, the, the strict control of cardiovascular risk factors, particularly blood pressure control, uh, the, the, the choosing of uh, different drug classes that allow you not only to uh, reduce um, peripheral blood pressure, but more importantly to reduce central blood pressure, as we have seen for vasodilatory drugs and especially for uh, inhibitors of the uh, renin angiotensin system, uh, and particularly drugs that not only vasodilate and reduce blood pressure, but also aid with the remodeling of the uh, arterial wall structure, as seems to be the case for uh, renin angiotensin uh, system uh, inhibitors. So finally, uh, I will show you uh, for the last uh, five minutes what we have been doing uh, in Guimarães. We were obviously interested in not only knowing what, have, what is the, the prevalence of the different risk factors in our population, uh, specifically because we are in an endemic area for stroke where the annual incidence of three strokes per 1,000 inhabitants occurs and is uh, uh, one of the highest of the uh, European, uh, Western European, European countries. And also um, to uh, really define um, and, and phenotype our uh, uh, subjects as well as we could concerning the different cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, so we decided to um, s set up an observational cross-sectional study that will evolve to a longitudinal study now that we've finished this first part. Uh, and that included a representative sample of the, the population of the two adjacent cities in, in Guimarães. These uh, subjects were randomly selected from the population, and afterwards uh, we um, discovered who their family doctor was, and the recruitment was done uh, through their, via their, uh, their family doctors, which obviously is a benefit for later on um, uh, uh, follow-up of these subjects. So we've proposed a two-strategy uh, visit, uh, these, these, uh, a two-visit two strategy. These visits were separated at least three months apart so that uh, different cardiovascular risk factors were measured twice, and that would allow us to phenotype more precisely subjects uh, with different uh, cardiovascular risk factors. So in the first visit, all of the uh, uh, family and personal clinical information was done, uh, as well as um, collection of, uh, of different blood samples and, measure and biological uh, measurements, weight, height, abdominal perimeter, blood pressure, pulse wave velocity, central blood pressure, uh, and EKG, uh, as well as urine samples. The second visit that happened, as I said, at least three visits, three months apart, we repeated these uh, measurements, repeated blood samples, had a collection of 24-hour urine sample um, uh, um, done by each of the subjects, and we included neurocognitive evaluation. This is because we are not only interested in vascular aging, but uh, more in, more interested in the concept of the global of the studying of the global uh, aging process. And um, we have then uh, included the, the in the switch box uh, study, which is a, a study that uh, tries to describe the association of, of key factors of aging. Uh, especially in, in cognitive healthy aging. And for people over 50 uh, that were participating in our cohort, we have a, a program, not only a neurocognitive evaluation, including memory and ex executive function tests, but also for those that have been set up as weak or strong performers in these tests, a follow-up study with imaging in functional MRI, uh, uh, functional electro electroencephalogram, and study of the different endocrinal uh, axis. So these were the, um, the laboratory workup that we included, and so far I will not bring you uh, many different data than what I've presented earlier, but we have accomplished 86 visits to 13 community health centers, included 84 researchers from 17 different clinical institutions. They have uh, worked for two years and 18 days of field observations that finished uh, last year. Um, and from the 4,000 subjects that were randomly subjected, we actually included 3,038 and have just gone through the process of uh, data cleaning and appropriate uh, database management. Uh, we are talking of, of something around 1,200 uh, var different variables to analyze. So out of the 5,000 outpatient visits, 1,047 cognitive evaluations and 2,024-hour urine samples, we will uh, we have uh, developed also a biobank with over 10,000 plasma uh, and serum samples, over 
5,000 urine samples and are now engaged in, in collaboration with, with different uh, groups to help uh, advance knowledge in, in, in different areas. So our research team is uh, this. These are people that work voluntarily with, within this project and that uh, I cannot thank enough. And the last word uh, is to invite you all for the third international postgraduate course that we have been uh, organizing uh, in Guimarães for the last two years. The following edition will be end 2013, beginning 2014. Uh, and uh, I hope that you can uh, have the interest to drop by and to not only uh, accompany the, the, the post-graduation course, but also get to know our city. And with this, I would thank you for your attention. <laughs>